Number one, when I was going through my treatment, I never shared any of the difficult stuff. I just, I wasn't comfortable making people feel sad for me. I wanted no pity. So when they said, how you doing? I'd say, great. Nobody had to know that I was sick or that I was in pain or whatever. I just, I, I brushed over it. But there was a lot of things that went on in my, my cancer experience that nobody ever warned me about. And I started thinking, how come nobody's talking about this stuff? There's all these things going, like my fingernails ripped off. Each round of chemo was kind of like a cycle of nail death. And eventually they all ripped off. Nobody mentioned that. That was totally curious to me. When my hair, when I went bald, you know, I was left with a skunk stripe down my head because of it. It was a tan line. I've always parted my hair in the middle. So I had this skunk stripe. And it's like nobody was talking about that. Nobody talked about the weird stuff. Some of it I thought was hilarious. So that plus, as I was going through it, I started thinking, boy, if I made some really good decisions, it was the perspective, it was the passions, it was remaining positive and so forth. And I thought people, you know, along with my corporate mission is to help people do better and be better. Welcome back to another empowering episode of Unleash Thyself. I am your host, Konstantin Morun, and today I'm thrilled to introduce Fitz Kohler, a fitness expert, race announcer, cancer-crushing keynote speaker, and best-selling author of the Cancer Comeback series. Fitz is not just about physical fitness. She's a powerhouse of resilience and mental strength, having battled and overcome breast cancer while continuing to inspire millions. So today, we'll explore her incredible journey, learning how she faced a cancer diagnosis head-on, what kept her going during the most challenging times, and how she turned her experience into motivational books and speeches. Fitz will also enlighten us on living our passions every single day, especially when times get tough. We'll also talk about what Fitz calls her strawberry moments, those daily instances of gratitude and joy that make life worth living. She'll teach us how to be our own best coach, how to extend kindness not just to those who are suffering, but to everyone we meet, and the importance of maintaining a positive self-dialogue. So, if you're looking to boost your physical mental, and emotional resilience, you won't want to miss today's episode. Let's dive in. Welcome back to Unleash Thyself, the podcast that inspires and empowers you to unleash your full potential. I am thrilled to welcome Fitz Kohler to the show. Fitz, we can't wait to hear more about your experiences and insights that have led you to where you are today, and your unleashed moment, the moment you knew you were on your own path to becoming the best version of yourself. Fitz, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Constantine. Nice to meet you. Likewise. So Fitz, your journey, fantastic, right? Of course, there were so many ups and so many downs along the way. Where would you like to start our conversation today? Where do I want to start? I'll start with the good stuff. I'm a happy girl (laughs) from Florida. I'm a freedom-loving fitness expert who I started teaching fitness at 15, fell in love with it, got my master's in exercise and sports sciences from the University of Florida. And I have fallen in love with the ability to help people live better and longer by making fitness specifically understandable, attainable, and fun. I do that via mass media, you know, so TV, radio, books, magazines, podcasts, you know, any way I can reach out to people and shake them a little bit, get their attention, get them informed and get them going makes me happy. Oh, that's awesome. And I've seen quite a bit of your work and it's, like you said, fantastic. And you you are truly making an impact in the lives of those that take a moment to listen and apply some of that knowledge. So let me ask you this. Of course, we start with the good stuff. There's lots of it across your life and the lives of many of other people that are in the audience right now. But of course, we can't have the good without the bad. Right. In 2019, you had a big battle with cancer. Yeah. If you may, let's let's talk a bit about your experience at the beginning of the journey and how you felt as someone that's been on such a journey of fitness and, and staying healthy. How did you take the fact that this disease yeah. just you know, despite everything you've done up to the point? Right. So I'll start by saying I never ever questioned why me. I am not that person. I don't I'm not big on pity parties. It doesn't work that way for Fitz Kohler. And in order to say, why me, you have to skip over all the babies that have had cancer. Like, why them, right? So I never thought, why me? I'm doing everything right. Why me? I thought, okay, I had a cell go rogue. 
here we go. Let's get it on and beat the hell out of this thing. But I was, I was certainly like anybody else, surprised that I was diagnosed. I had a clean, sparkling clean mammogram at the end of 2018 in late December. And seven weeks later, I just got out of the shower naked. I rubbed my under boob. It was itchy. I found a lump. So that was surprising. I knew right away what it was. But then I took action. And this is what people need to take from my experiences at, you know, you get those annual exams, get them, get all of them. But then between the annual exams, you still have to be diligent that your your health is your own responsibility. And so, so many people, they'll find something weird, a lump, a discoloration, a pain, and they ignore it. You know, or they call their friends and they cry or they call their mom or they Google it. I didn't do any of those things. I just picked up the phone in that bathroom while naked and called my doctor and said, I found a lump and that got the wheels in motion. And so within about a week or so, I had the appointment that led to the mammogram, then the ultrasound, then the punch biopsy, and then the phone call that said, Fitz, I'm so sorry, but you have cancer. I didn't like it, but... Yeah. So in that moment, how did you take it? Did you did you go through any of those steps of grief that people normally go through when they are faced with something so tough? Absolutely. And and really my point where I knew what I had wasn't the biopsy results. It was and the ultrasound. They the doctor said, you know, there's a mass, and I could see the mass on the little TV screen they had. She said, this mass looks suspicious, but you have three hard swollen lymph nodes I'm concerned about. So at that point, not only did I know that I had cancer, but I, I knew that it had already spread. And I knew that it was spreading like wildfire because how in seven weeks could it go from nothing, all of that. And so I thought for sure I was going to die. And I had no data to say that. I just, I thought, holy hell, you know, I thought I have the perfect career. I'm, I'm the perfect beacon of health and happiness. I got the perfect family, perfect career. I'm definitely going to make the perfect tale of tragedy. I just thought for sure. And while I, I grieved the loss of my own life, and I love life. I think like, yay, above ground. I'm super happy to be alive. I don't know what is or isn't on the other side, but I like it here very much. But really the thing that devastated me was not being able to watch my children grow up, not being with them. I, I, I grieved the loss of their lives, which was tough. But yeah, fortunately, about, a, I don't know, 10 weeks, two, 10 days, two weeks later, my oncologist, after getting particular results, assured me that he had a cure waiting for me. He said, if it's, you know, it's going to be long and there's, it's going to be hard, but you're going to get there and we're going to cure you. And I believed him. That's good because I, I, I would imagine the self-belief and believing that you are on a path that can cure you or can put you on a healthier or for a, towards a healthier outcome. It's very important to our mental strength. And I know you talk a lot about mental strength. How were you able to tap into that based on everything you've done in the fitness world and everything you've done in your life up to that point? Yeah. Tap into your mental strength to overcome such a difficult time. Yeah. So my mental strength was grown over time, right? It came from a series of failures and rejections and all of those things that feel like, oh, they're going to kill you at the moment. And they don't. And you become a little more resilient every single time. So I've certainly had a wonderful life of joy and success, but there've been plenty of failures in there. Pity parties aren't my thing. And over-dramatizing a simple situation. My, we broke up. My life is over. Really? You just broke up, right? I lost my job. My life is over. I didn't get into the college of my dreams. My life is over. So those dramatics never seemed okay to me. So, so I would, that was built in, you know, a choosing to be happy and then watch other people over dramatize simple situations. I thought, well, oh, that's absurd. I'm not going to be like that person. And then, you know, when it comes to me, when I, when I have, again, those rejections or those disappointments, I like, okay, this feels bad right now. What does this mean for the long run? And so with cancer, you know, I had to stick with my perspective. Number one, I, I thought, well, I'm not a kid with cancer and it's not my kid with cancer. So perspective. I can always look at the bright side. And for me, you know, if, ca if cancer had to come to my home, I'm so, so happy it chose me. You know, I would much rather be the patient than the mother of the patient anytime. So that was number one. I chose right away to pursue my passion. So it's interesting how many people say, oh, you're sick, hide out at home, wear a mask, cover up, disappear. And I was diagnosed before the COVID stuff. But even back then, people were like, oh, you have cancer. You have to stay home. And I thought, F that, I have cancer. I'm not letting it steal, steal my life before it steals my life. I'm going. So I got on 30-something planes out of my hometown of Gainesville, Florida to go announce my races, to go do my keynote speeches, to travel some for fun. I, I left home multiple times a week to go support my children at their sporting events, their ceremonies, their whatever special occasions they had. And 
those decisions were really empowering. A, I made them up front. And when I make a decision, that's it. It's over. I've made it. So I knew no matter how sick I got, I got very, 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 very sick. And uh, no matter how bad things were, and at some points they were really bad, I was not missing out on my kids or my career. And I stuck to that. Wow, that's such an inspiring uh, approach that fits because I, I know a lot of people that, like you said, give up almost in that moment before the time when they maybe should or shouldn't. And being able to, like you said, put your head down and focus on the things you can control, like your job or your business, your family, perhaps put you on this path where now we're having this conversation, right? Because otherwise, if you give up, it's likely that the universe, God, whatever you believe in is going to give, you know, it's going to not put those opportunities in your path anymore because you've given up on yourself. There's so much evidence that shows a strong attitude. The will to live goes a really long way. And when you put that will to live with healthy habits, a healthy body that has been cared for and tended to and built up strong, you are so much more likely to survive. And not only that, but thrive. You know, it's funny if I would have stayed home like people told me to. Oh, so annoying. All I would have been was sick. All I would have been was sick. And I was violently ill every day. Don't be confused. The fact that I was traveling, that I was okay. I was not. But if I would have stayed home, it just would have been miserable, sick and tired and so forth. So was traveling across the country sick like that tough? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did I have some strange experiences in airport and airplane bathrooms? You betcha. However, when I get to my point B, whether it was a keynote or race, even if I had spent the night on the hotel bathroom floor because I was sick, I would get up. The second I stepped onto my stages, everything that was wrong with me disappeared. I wasn't suffering. I wasn't tired. I, my stomach like calmed down and I got to be full force Fitz Kohler again in the middle of this mayhem of hell. I got to have these glorious moments of feeling fabulous. And I say moments, sometimes those moments lasted for 10 hours when I'm working Sometimes it's for a really long time. It's 5 a.m. to 3 p.m. type thing. It was incredible. And so if I would have stayed home, I would have missed out on all of that goodness. It just, it, it was a no-brainer for me. And, and I encourage people, those passions of yours, they're important on all the healthy days. Of course, you should go and listen to music and, you know, pursue your hobbies and your people. When things hit the fan, when you are sick, those passions matter more than ever. Those people matter more than ever. The, the sick and demented concept that you would take sick people and isolate them is nothing short of sick and demented. It's just gross. And I, I didn't fall for it. I totally believe if you're contagious, keep your germs to yourself until you're not contagious and then get back out in life. But you know, cancer is not con contagious. Diabetes isn't contagious. Heart disease isn't contagious. Get out and go live your life while you have it, right? Hey, it's Constantine here. And I want to take a brief moment to truly thank you for being a part of this incredible journey of transformation. You are the reason we are creating this content. I see you and I appreciate you. Your support truly means the world to me. I want to ask you for a small favor. I'd love for you to join our mission by hitting like, subscribe, or leaving a thoughtful comment or review. Your engagement helps others discover these insights and together we can continue to unlock the power of authenticity and personal transformation. And if you want to reach out directly to me, send me an email at constantine at unleashedyself.com. I value any and all feedback. Thank you for being a part of this movement. Now, back to the episode. I love that message. Fitz, and it resonates so well with me as we chat before we, we jumped live. I believe it you want you should want should want to follow your heart and do what your passions are and you're a testament to that because you went and did that and like you said once you're doing those things you didn't even feel the disease yes you had the moments yeah. that were tough before and after but in that moment that's what kept you going that's what kept you getting better and better and all of a sudden you're also a great role model not just for the people you inspired on the stages and, and the races you attended but also your kids and your family i would imagine well, I hope so. You know, it's interesting. So for my whole life, people would say, she's so inspirational. I think, no, I'm not. I'm compelling. I'm educated. I'm talented at what I do. And I'm compelling. I don't look at myself at an, as inspirational. And and then, you know, as I look back at those pictures of me and my bald head traveling the country, you know, walking the walk, I go, okay, maybe there was some of that in there. And I'm I'm okay with that. You know, my work is about you. It's not about me, right? So it's interesting who have been to 
have walked in the shoes. My shoes have been, have carried someone around who really was pursuing health and life through hardship. So yeah, I guess, I guess the inspirational thing fits. It's, it's not something I ever wanted before, but I, I hope, I hope to encourage people to do better and be better in all situations. Absolutely. And that's a beautiful message because at the end of the day, I look at my own life because it's all I really know. And I see that when I have conversation with people like yourself and other guests I've had on the show, and even in my personal life or my work life, you do find inspiration or can find inspiration in almost anyone you look around. But those people that show you a way of doing things that maybe you haven't considered or you haven't thought about yeah. is what truly gets you moving. Like the example you just gave around, you know, you could stay home, you could be sick, but on those days, that's when you want to pursue your passions more, you want to hang out with people. Yeah. So then you can bring some light into those dark days. And that's such an important and beautiful message that most people don't follow or don't advise. Like you said, right? You were told, stay home, don't yeah. no overwork yourself, do these things. And of course, you want to follow some of that. But if all you do is stay concerned, stay in the darkness, how are you going to come out to the other side of the light? Yeah, you know, what's interesting is I, uneducated people in my circles that were just caring friends and family, I'm not picking on them, but they were... They're certainly not cancer experts or health experts in any regard. Those were the people that were like, no, you can't go. You can't get on a plane. Even before the whole world was wearing masks, they're like, you got to wear a mask. And I thought, you're out of your tree. But my doctor, my oncologist never once said, Fitz, you should stay home. Never once said, Fitz, you should hide out and wear a mask. This was a man who said, I'm going to get you on your feet so you can go live your life. You know, he hooked me up with IV fluids five days a week for six months um, to keep me going. That's what I needed. I was, I was, because I was so sick, I was always dehydrated, which has these devastating effects. So he kept pumping me full of fluids so I could go. I never said, and I had three different doctors and I had the radiology oncologist, the hematology oncologist, and the surgeon never did any one of them tell me to stop. So I took their advice. I, I did not accept advice from randoms, uh, although everyone had a lot of advice, right? As you can imagine. But but yeah, those who are really experts in the world of cancer knew that living my life to the fullest while I had it was going to increase my chances of survival. And, you know, I look back and let's say I wasn't going to survive. And, and sadly, there are a lot of men and women, both who died from breast cancer. How would I have wanted my last year to play out? Yes. Within the four walls of my bedroom, in that bathroom? Or would I have wanted to enjoy every freaking day as much as I could? I had chemo for 15 months and it was broken up into two different types of chemo. So the first five months we dubbed the mean chemo. It was this four drug concoction. It was nasty and it was a real problem for me. And then I had 10 months of a different chemo that was still really difficult, but less. I wasn't as violently sick. And so it was at the end of the fifth month, my final round of mean chemo came and I was a mess. I mean, I was my, every part of me was a mess and I was really struggling and I had gone to Orlando and I was flying home from a race so sick. And instead of coming home, I went to Orlando to watch my daughter cheer. She was a high school cheerleader and she had a cheerleading competition at a cheer camp in Orlando. And I had a particularly difficult night and it was in that morning where I thought, now I understand why people stop treatment. You know, when someone gets to that point in their cancer care where the doctor says, I, I can't do anything else for you, or this is not, this is not going to be a, a long-term solution, and they stop their drugs, and I never could understand why anyone would give up. So it was that morning where I thought, okay, I get it. If I was never going to be better than I am today, I would discontinue continue treatment. So that was, that was an aha moment I never wanted to have, but I, I got it. I finally I got through my fat head. And then... A few hours later, I went to this arena to go watch my daughter cheer. And again, I was so sick. Everything on me felt so bad. And I was so happy to be there with her and her teammates and all the other children out there cheering. And I also thought, okay, if I was dying, this is where I'd want to be. Yeah. And if I love someone dying from now on, I will never encourage them to miss out on special moments in their life. If you're if you have a sick person in your life who's terminally ill, let them go to church, bring them to the restaurant, let them go to work, take them to the mall, take them to a fair, whatever it is. You know, I, I survived. So 
I think sometimes people look at me and they see how healthy I am now and they go, oh, she really couldn't have been that sick. No, I was on death's door for, you know, I was hospitalized with blood transfusions. I was a train wreck. But these are things you learn by hitting rock bottom. This, These are things you learn by going through devastating illness and sickness. And, you know, I really think all of these people who are terminally ill and their family meaning well says, don't come. We don't want you to come to the birthday party because you have cancer. And I I mean, let them die at the birthday party because at least they'll die in in a place surrounded by love and joy. You know, that's how I would have wanted to go out. I would have, I would rather just drop that on my stage than than, you know, been tucked away in a corner somewhere for death. That's such a beautiful message and powerful message. It gives me chills, right? And I'm getting emotional mm-hmm. because you're so right. It sounds like in your example as well, you focused on all the positives despite yeah. all the negatives. Someone sick comes along to, let's say, like you said, the fair or to the movies, and the focus is on the sickness still. It's on whatever the sickness might be. Mm-hmm. And instead of focusing on what the event or what the gathering is for. Yeah. Life. Life. Let's... if. If you can do life, do it. Do it until your final day, right? It, it's just these lessons you learn. I didn't want to learn these lessons, but I had some aha moments that were really poignant for me. And, you know, I hope I hope other people hear them and then do better because of them. How have you seen these type of lessons impact your personal life with others? So, for example, when you were the sick, did you see people kind of retract a bit, not invite you to things that you used to be invited to? gatherings or otherwise? And how did you react in those moments? So I, I I did have a couple of friends ghost me, like lifelong best friends just completely disappeared, never called, never checked in. So that was really weird, very disappointment, disappointing. But overwhelmingly, I had so much kindness in my life. It was kindness and care from my family, from my friends, from acquaintances, from strangers. You know, I was, I never wore a wig. So I took my bald head on the road and people knew. I also, I never wore a shirt that said like breast cancer warrior, or I never wore a pink ribbon. I don't wear those things. They make me feel like a victim. So, you know, I'm not giving this disease any more room, any more place on my chest. I'm dinged up. I got scars. It's fine. I don't need to wear the shirt, but people knew, right? So, you know, my family, they did everything I needed when I was at home. And then when I was on the road, you know, strangers were constantly simple things, simple things like picking up my luggage and putting it over in the overhead bin for me, or just simple, I'm rooting for you. You know, people didn't know I had cancer, but they suspected, right? I mean, there was all of these kindness and and from every type of person, right? Black, white, green, red, purple, polka dotted people that pray to different gods and have different amounts of incomes. And they were all so generous and kind. The running community, they stepped up big time. So my job as a race announcer is to take care of them, make sure when they hit a start and finish line that they know what to do, they know where to go, they're having a great time, they feel special, they feel welcome and then accomplished. So that's my role to take care of them. They, anytime I would show up at a race, people were coming with gifts. It was hats and it was mugs and shirts and presents out the yin yang and cards and gift cards. And if it were foul weather, random people, people I had never met before. And that's the beauty of this social media thing. And, you know, people knew who I was, they knew what I was going through and it was raining. One, one race had like seven people show up with umbrellas and ponchos. We thought you might be wet. We thought you might need this. People were coming with blankets, with snacks, drinks. There was a couple of people that brought snacks and drinks and prevented me from passing out because I had not prepared accordingly myself. So man, it, people are so good. I, I think it's sad when sometimes we watch the news and we just think the worst of people. And almost overwhelmingly, all I saw was the best of people when I was going through it. It was a real, you know, real blessing. Well, that's what a beautiful uh, part of the story that it fits. And it, it, it got me thinking of something, right? What if we could do more of what you experienced for people that are not necessarily sick? Yeah. So keep doing that for others as well. Sometimes it feels like we wait for someone to be in a position like you were in to lend a helping hand or to feel like we need to help. But in reality, a lot of the things that people struggle with, you can't necessarily see, like especially anything with mental health. So I wonder how much of that story we can take and turn into an inspiration for others to start giving a bit of their love, right? Maybe some of their food, whatever the case might be, to make someone else day that much better. Because most people... They may go days or weeks or even months without a nice gesture being done to them by anyone. 
Yeah. So, so you're right. I think it's always important to compliment when you can show chivalry when you can, you know, the compliments are easy. I like your shoes, great bag, nice hair, beautiful day, beautiful smile, whatever. And I'm the queen of the compliments. Cause I just, that's who I am. It's almost probably annoying to people around me. Like, shut up, Fitz. Stop telling everybody how great they are. But those are free. Those are easy to pass on. You know, acts of chivalry are always appreciated. You know, it's interesting. I have a few friends in my life who have like the gender issues, right? They're not sure where they feel in the world and they're uncomfortable with chivalry. I love chivalry. And, and I certainly do men to women chivalry, but also I am chivalrous. I love to open doors for people. I love to carry heavy, heavy bags for people who need help. If somebody spills something, I pick it up. I think chivalry and courtesy can go in all directions and it makes me feel good. Am I helping the other person? For sure. But it's, it's almost selfish. Like I just really like to do it. And again, it's free. It's free. It doesn't require any money. And you, it's just as easy. It's easy, right? It's just easy. We're not, it's something that all people are not necessarily taught how to do or shown how to do growing up perhaps, or in the environment culture, but it's something that we can all do more of, even those that are doing it. Like I'm someone that's learning to do more and more of that. And you're right. Like the free stuff is so easy to do. And not only does it make them potentially feel good, but like you said, it makes you feel good, which was the biggest aha moment for me. Because when I started doing more of these things, such as, like you said, opening the door, or maybe giving some money or some food to a homeless person or seeing someone and picking up some food for them or paying it forward, I didn't realize how much it impacted me in a good way and how much it elevated my mood, not just for the day, but potentially for the week. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So when I was sick, people had to help. I had two kids. They were 13 and 15 at the time. They weren't, they couldn't drive. They had to go to school. Mm -hmm. They had activities. They had stuff. And there were days where I couldn't drive and my husband was working. So lots of people started driving my, like friends, they were taking, picking up Ginger and Parker and driving them places. People started bringing meals to the home, which again, I'm a helper, not a helpie. Boy, does it feel weird to have people say, I'm going to bring you food. But the way I, I accepted that help was A, knowing we needed it. But B, I just committed that once I was better, I was going to spend the rest of my life paying it forward. You know? So have I driven people to doctor's appointments? You betcha. Have I picked up the meds? Yep. Have I brought meals? Oh, I always have. So, you know, maybe if you think, oh, it's weird. It, it, no, start doing nice things now because you never know when you may have to be the awkward recipient of help and kindness. And then it's a little more comfortable to receive it knowing that you've you've done your share of helping too. And it's funny on the microphone, whether I'm announcing a race or I'm speaking, I tell everybody that I love them. And I I know some people in the audience, when they're hearing me announce a race, they're like, how does she know that person? How does she love that person? I don't know all of them. Some of them are friends that I've really only spent about 17 seconds in person with at one point. But do I love them? Yeah. Do I care about them? I do. And so I even think it's okay to throw around the world the word, I love you. Now, if my husband heard me telling, you know, guys in the street, I love you, he doesn't think twice. He never was like, "Uh uh-oh, there's a problem. She said she loves him. He goes, you know, she loves everybody. My wife takes care of everybody. So if you can make love and loving people and telling them you love them a habit, again, that's free. And that's a sweet, sweet experience for all involved, right? Yeah, I like this message, right? Because we're all human at the end of the day, right? We're all the same. Despite what we believe in or how we look, we're all the same. Right. Yeah. It's just my, my, my posse probably looks like a pretty eclectic group and I'm okay with that. Yeah, I I can see that. But let me ask you this. You conquered this disease in in cancer Mm -hmm. and then you you wrote a couple of books or a few books actually around it. Can you tell us a bit more about first what inspired you to write the books and then the impact of them? Sure. So the first book is a memoir. And I wrote that for two reasons. Number one, when I was going through my treatment, I never shared any of the difficult stuff. I just, I wasn't comfortable making people feel sad for me. I wanted no pity. So when they said, how you doing? I'd say, great. Nobody had to know that I was sick or that I was in pain or whatever. I just, I, I brushed over it. But there was a lot of things that went on in my, my cancer experience that nobody ever warned me about. And I started thinking, how come nobody's talking about this stuff? There's all these things going like my fingernails ripped off. Each round of chemo was kind of like a cycle of nail death. And eventually they all ripped off. Nobody mentioned that. That was totally curious to me. When my hair, when I went bald, 
you know, I was left with a skunk stripe down my head because of it. It was a tan line. I've always parted my hair in the middle. So I had this skunk stripe. And it's like nobody was talking about that. Nobody talked about the weird stuff. Some of it I thought was hilarious. So that plus, as I was going through it, I started thinking, boy, if I made some really good decisions, it was the perspective, it was the passions, it was remaining positive and so forth. And I thought people, you know, along with my corporate mission is to help people do better and be better. I can help them. So that's where my noisy cancer comeback. It's running at the mouth while running at the life. So that's the memoir. And this book is sold like hotcakes. And it's re- it's a real boost for your mental health, whether you are whether you have cancer or not. It's hot amongst cancer patients, but the running communities adopted it and just, just people who need a boost, right? And then- I Imagine if I may interrupt that for a second yeah. with this book, it's also for those people that may have someone with an illness in their family, right? Right, right. There's a lot of little insight, insider scoop that you may not know how to help if you haven't read it. So yeah, it's great for caregivers as well and friends. And then this next book, Your Healthy Cancer Comeback, Sick to Strong. This is one I'm so excited about because this is the heart of who I am. You know, when I um, was going through it, when I hit rock bottom physically, I was so skeletally thin and very weak because over time, again, 15 months of chemo, I was just battered and things got bad. But when I hit rock bottom, I never had a doubt that I would rebuild my body and get back to strong and vibrant and athletic. Why? Because I'm a fitness expert. Hooray. You know, I knew I could rebuild it. But then I thought about all my peers, all of my fellow cancer patients and survivors who were having the hell beat out of them by cancer and care, this chemo radiation surgeries, and they had no idea how to rebuild their bodies. And so that's why I wrote this one. This is using my highly credentialed fitness expertise with my cancer street cred. And so this book is everything. It talks nutrition. There's food that helps, food that hurts. Can we steer patients towards making their body a more hostile environment for cancer by boosting their immune system with nutrition? Can we avoid the foods that will make your body uh, weakened and more susceptible to more cancer and more infection. Yeah. So there's, there's a ton of nutrition, but really what I love is the exercise part. So I go, I break it down nuts and bolts, how to address exercise after diagnosis. Once each type of treatment starts, I hold your hand as you go through chemo, radiation, surgeries, if you have all three. And then there's a huge photo pictorial. So not everybody really knows how to exercise and they don't understand how to work each body part. So here's a bunch of strength training exercises, like tons of photos of exercises, how to work your shoulders and your back and your abs and stretches too. And then let's say that you're super, you're, you have a lower body thing. You have bone cancer and they've amputated a leg. Here's a whole bunch of exercises you can do sitting in a chair. And then let's say like me, you're having a bunch of sick days, like stay in bed days. Here's a whole bunch of exercises you can do lying in bed. (laughs) And then If you're also like me and because you're sick, you get in the shower a lot. So I was always in the shower because I was so sick. Every single time I got in the shower, I would stretch. I would let the warm water fall over me and I would play either great music or Jerry Seinfeld interviews because he makes me happy. And I would just stretch in there and it it was great. So there's there's a real rhyme or reason to blowing the decline, you know, and that's a big thing. Can you, can you prevent the loss of muscle mass? Can you prevent the loss of mobility and balance? You don't, if you don't lose your balance, you don't fall down, right? So exercise is really important for a cancer patient. Now you keep consider capacity, compassion, you know, do you have to go out and take a CrossFit class while you're sick with chemo? No, but can you do something? Usually it's about doing what you can, when you can talk about complimentary rest and then complement or quality rest, complementary care, like acupuncture, physical therapy, all of those. So that's your healthy cancer comeback. And then along with it, the third book is the healthy cancer comeback journal. And it's proven that journaling is very cathartic and healing. So there's a bunch of places to stash your, your diagnosis details and your scan results because it's hard to keep track of, you know, especially once the medications start altering your mind. But then there's, and it's full color, so it's super happy. I want my readers to pick up the book and think, hooray, this is fun. There's a place to color in your bald head. We do Advent style countdown calendars for chemo, radiation, surgery, so they could cross it off as they go. A place to, here's the radiation Advent calendar, place to document your fears, your faith, your family, 
the funny stuff. One of the questions in here is, what celebrity do you look like bald? And for me, it was crazy Britney Spears. That's that's exactly what I look like when I was bald because everybody told me that. And in fact, in this book, I have a top 10 list of celebrities I was told that I look like bald. But but yeah, the books, the books are, they make me so happy because they're helping so many people. And when you come out of something like cancer, you many of us think, what can I do? And this is what I did. Wow. I mean, to me, it sounds like, you know, the beginning I asked you about the why, right? If you ever wondered why you got cancer. But the more you tell us the story, the more you show us all the things that came out of it between your approach to how you handle that, to the books and the help you're giving people. It almost sounds like this was a challenge that you were to face so you can come out stronger and now share a beautiful message with everyone else so they can be better in their own lives. Yeah. You know, I appreciate that. It's funny. People are like, maybe it's happened for a reason. And I think, no, I don't believe any sort of deity looked at me and planted a seed of doom in my boob. I don't, I don't accept that. However, it's in my nature to make the best out of a bad situation. And, you know, this right here is my lemonade. These are the things that when cancer patients reach out and say, oh my God, this helped me so much. I feel like, okay, I'm, I'm not at the point yet where I would go back and you know, if I could go back and choose cancer, not cancer for me, I would definitely say not cancer, right? but I can't. So I had cancer and there are many, many, many silver linings. These, book be, these books being three of them. Yes, that's a beautiful message. So let me ask you this. I mean, you just mentioned being able to go back. Let's say you could go back, but you couldn't choose if you had cancer or not. You would get cancer. But what are maybe some things you would tell your younger self in that moment to get you through the tough times maybe slightly easier or with more hope? Yeah. I mean, I, the, the worst, the worst was the first two weeks when I thought I was dying, you know, and again, there was no statistical evidence. I was just making stuff up in my head. Like you are going to die. Right. So I wish she wouldn't have, I wish I wouldn't have done those things. And then, you know, it's all very haunting because even let's say the cancer is not going to kill you. Some people end up in the hospital and I did, I could have had an infection some people have allergic reactions to the chemotherapy. Some people die on a surgery table. I mean, you're constantly at a, in a vul vulnerable place. So, you know, even though I had a really good attitude, the, you know, the Grim Reaper was kind of here. And I, I mean, I look around my office and I think, well, if I die soon, all of this stuff is garbage. Like they're just throwing out everything, right? I look at the clothes I own, like who wants this crap? It's just garbage if I'm not here. So I wish I could tell her, it's going to be okay. And stop thinking that way. You know, it's just, it wasn't, those weren't my overwhelming thoughts, but they were there. And I, I think that's only natural, but if I could have got myself to not think of that stuff at all, I, I would happily go back and help her out. She yeah. was scared. And I can imagine that can help a lot of people as well, because if anyone you love goes through that, or you go through it yourself, it's good to remind yourself of the positive stuff and not dwell too much on the things you can't control and the negatives and like you said right. making up stories or looking only at the negative side of things and of course something like cancer is very negative right there's uh, very few positives in it but the positives around your life yes so they are not changing right just because you have cancer so maybe focusing on those can help so there's a couple things you just said so number one so this is your healthy cancer comeback the chapter of title number one of uh, title of chapter number one control and that's it. It's about controlling what you can. Can you control your health, your, your physical health? Yeah, you can control a lot of your outcomes by exercising, eating right, sleeping, getting that complimentary care. Can you do certain things that make the cancer more likely to go away, less likely to come back? Yeah, control those things. And then, you know, we talked about the mental health. There's, do you know what strawberry moments are? I sure the not, no. Okay. So strawberry moments are something I've harped on in all three books, but my children go to this summer camp or went to a summer camp and it's a sleepaway camp in the middle of the woods that they'd spend two weeks there. And at every night before bedtime in, in their cabin, the counselors would have all the, the campers gather around and each would share their strawberry moment for the day. So every single day, the strawberry moment was your best moment of the day. And so for some kids, it's winning the canoe race or learning a funny new song or you know, making a new friend with camp, that's your strawberry moments. With cancer, there are always strawberry moments too. You know, so maybe it's your nurse was super sweet or maybe you got great news or maybe you got a great text from a friend, but in the back of the journal, so there's all daily logs where exercise, nutrition, sleep, hydration, but then on the right side is right there, boom. And so this will force the patient and survivor to write down their strawberry moment for each day and 
you know, you have to control the things you can. You can control your attitude. You control your personal efforts. And, you know, you don't have to wait for cancer to control those things. You can still control the way you care for your body and the way you control your mind. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of things in the world are really manageable when we're doing our best for ourselves. Yeah, I mean, everything you talked about right now can be done regardless of what disease or ailments you may have, right? Like you said, because you can always focus more on the stuff you control and the strawberry moments. The way I apply it into my own life is every day I look at what I'm grateful for, for that specific day. That's what I do at night. And then in the morning, I'm looking at more of a holistic approach. Like, okay, maybe my life, maybe my work environment, my personal life, whatever the case might be. And those are really strawberry moments if I were to compare. If you are a person who regularly ignores your health and you regularly put yourself down, if you're one of those people who looks in the mirror and goes, I'm fat, I'm no good, I'm bad, you know, whatever negative things you want to say about yourself, don't expect to have a lot of success when things hit the fan. You know, if you are already someone who's trashing your body and your brain and all the things you do, when things are good, you are really not going to be an ally for yourself when things are bad. Because in the, it's it's in those worst moments we find out who you are. So it's funny when whenever you get diagnosed with cancer, no matter who you are, people say you're the bravest person I know. And I got a lot of that, out of like thousands of people. To, you're so brave. You're so strong. And I was like, really? Now I'm the strongest person you know. But what happened is, uh, you know, I had a few fairly terrifying experiences for me before I started treatment. And during one particularly harried MRI where I'm claustrophobic and the whole thing went south, it was a bad time, but I had to stay in this MRI machine for 45 minutes. And, and I was... I. I had already tried to escape. There was, there was screaming and kicking and flailing. They got me out and then they shoved me back in and said, you can't start chemo. You cannot start killing this cancer until you sit through this MRI. So I had to force myself to do it. And for 45 minutes, like a total fruitcake, like a total nutso, but also like a total boss, I sat there and I told myself, you can do hard things. You have, you have built a global business. You have raised two great kids. You used to be a competitive kickboxer. You can do this. And so for 45 minutes, that little psychopath in my head, she was like, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And here's why. And she got me through it. You know, that was it. Because if it weren't for her, I would have once again screamed and flailed and hyperventilated and escaped and the cancer killing wouldn't have started. So every time I had to sit down for chemo, even if my husband was with me, my husband's a big, strong cop. Great. That doesn't help you when I, all, I had to take all the drugs. You know, every time a nurse came out with a needle, she wasn't giving him half the pokes. They were all for me. Every drug for me was for me. Every operation was for me. Every zap of radiation for, was for me. All of it. So I had to be my own best coach. You know, I had to do that. And so everything we've discussed today is all learnable skills. You know, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or black or white or Catholic or Jewish. It doesn't matter. You can take care of your health. You can exercise. You can choose to put food, good foods in your mouth versus bad foods. And then you can choose to be your best friend, to be your coach, to be your encourager, to be the person who gets you through through things. And then the person who is actually proud of you. It's okay to be proud of yourself. I look back, I'm super proud of the way I dealt with all of this. Was I perfect? No. Am I ever perfect? No. Do I think perfect's boring? Yes. I have no interest in perfection, but I did a damn good job. And these books are are super useful. And I know that if something horrible happens again, I've got my own back. You got to be able to get have your own back. That's such a powerful message. You have to be your best friend, right? You have to love yourself to be able to, to get through those tough moments. Yeah. And I can yeah. totally resonate with that because there have been many times in my life when I wasn't my best friend. Me too. Right? right? And it's about learning, like you said. Learning, sometimes the lessons are harder than it should be, but let's learn from them and, and move on. Yeah, knowledge and maturity. Maturity goes a long way. Yes, absolutely. And from conversations like this, if people can avoid having to experience the hard lessons, yes. then we help the tiny bit. Yeah, if you can avoid it completely, I highly recommend avoid completely. No hard times for anybody. Just exactly right. Just I mean, no hard times. If it's you know, let's say we can reduce it ten percent, one percent even, then that's that's a good start, right? Absolutely right. I love this conversation fits so far. So uh, tell us, where can people find uh, more of you if they want to connect or even find your book? Yeah. So I, my headquarters is fitness.com. That's F-I-T-Z as in zebra, N-E-S-S. So the word fitness with my Z in the middle, fitness.com. And all my books are available there. Any books that are ordered through me at fitness.com, I sign them. 
So if you love someone with cancer, I'm hoping none of your listeners and viewers have cancer, but I'm, I know 100% that they all love someone with cancer. They make a great gift. When you think, I wish I could do something, this is something you could do. So the books purchased at my site, I personally inscribe and I send a free gift with each and every one of the books because I like to do that. Fitness.com has a ton of free resources for anyone trying to get fit. There's an online training course. There's a whole bunch of stuff there. Just go visit and snoop around and see what you like. The books are also available wherever books are sold worldwide. My Noisy Cancer Comeback has audiobook and the others are print. And let's see, I'm also at Fitness on social media. And, you know, I, if you follow, I promise quality content in return. But really what I'd rather is people say, hello, say, I heard you on Constantine's podcast. And I wanted to say hi, because I would much rather have friends than followers. So unleash thyself on Fitness at Instagram and we can be best friends. Awesome. Such a pleasure to have you here with us today, Fitz. So before I let you go for today and we wrap this up, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience? Anything that we haven't covered? Any beautiful messages of wisdom? Yeah, I mean, you guys can do hard things too. I'm not a superhero. I'm just a regular girl who figured it out. And, you know, every day you should be doing something hard, something that challenges you, something that makes you happy, something that makes you better. Life is short. And uh, yeah, if you start living fully then you make the best of your days. And, and when the hard stuff comes, they won't feel so bad. I love that message. Thank you, Fitz. It's thank been you. such a pleasure to have you with us today. And I can't thank you enough for everything you've shared, for being vulnerable and all the wisdom and lessons learned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on this exploration of personal transformation. Your presence and engagement are at the heart of what we do. And I sincerely appreciate you, your time, and thirst for knowledge, inspiration, and empowerment. Please consider showing your support by hitting like, subscribe, leaving a comment, or writing a review. Your engagement not only fuels our mission, but also helps others discover these insights. For more daily guidance on personal transformation across the mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical realms, be sure to visit our website at unleashthyself.com. You can also find us on Instagram at Unleash Thyself Today, TikTok and YouTube at Unleash Thyself, and there we post daily content designed to inspire and empower you on your journey. If you have any specific thoughts, questions, or feedback, I truly value your input. Or if you'd like to have a conversation with me, or work with me, please feel free to email me directly at constantine at unleashthyself.com. I would love to hear from you. Together, we're building a community united in authenticity and purpose. Once again, thank you for being a part of this movement. Until next time, continue to embrace your true self and live a life on purpose with purpose. See you in the next episode.